people think that oh if i have nothing to hide i have nothing to worry about actually this is not true we are facing a global threat for democracy if we don't have journalists to inform because they are surveilled if we don't have whistleblowers or sources able to communicate with the journalists because there is a cyber surveillance if we don't have opponents able to work to fight for democracy there is a big risk for all of us the first thing is to realize the harm and the damages that this cyber surveillance and this lack of regulation is causing. Cyber surveillance is destroying life at a human being level. It is a kind of radioactive thing. Cyber surveillance, it's a weapon. It's a military weapon used against civilians. I'm delighted to be chatting today with Laurent Richard, who is the founder and director of Forbidden Stories and also the co-author of the book Pegasus. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thank you for having me. So let's start just by explaining what Forbidden Stories is, because it's an epic undertaking and a really impressive and courageous group of people who are doing their best to just shine light in dark places around the world. I agree. I think you did a very good presentation of what Forbidden Stories is. It's a group of brave people. It's true. Uh, brave people who are continuing the work of other reporters who have been killed, who have been jailed, who have been threatened. Uh, we are a large investigative network of, um, of journalists. And, uh, and so our mission is, is quite simple. When someone is, uh, is killed on the field because he or she was investigating uh, a story, we are here to continue the story. And why we do that? We do that with two goals. The first is to make sure people get access to the story. And the second goal is to make sure that the killer will think twice next time, that killing the journalist won't kill the story. And we want to persuade them that it's not a good idea at all. And it's worst, actually, to kill a, to try to kill a journalist. And it's incredible because I've looked into some of the stories that your organization has released. And you have people who are in these dangerous places around the world. They're being targeted by governments who want to silence them because the journalist is exposing corruption or doing something to embarrass them. And so people in power will target these journalists. And there have been, it, it, it's actually astounding how many journalists have been killed just for the stories that they've been writing. So you guys pick up where they left off and finish the story. Yeah, ab absolutely. Not only we investigate about who might be behind the killing, but we try to continue the story as far as we can. For instance, we did the cartel project. We were continuing the work of Regina Martinez, who was a Mexican journalist. She has been killed. He was investigating corruption of politicians over there uh, with drug cartels and, and, and local politics. And we investigate in Mexico, but we investigate organized crime groups who were working with the Mexican drug cartels all over the world, in Europe, in Africa, in the US. And, and that's we, we try to make those local stories and local crimes becoming a global story, a global story for that that matters for the future for democracy. We do we don't do that to pay a tribute to the other journalists. We 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 are doing that to make sure that we will be accessing to the most important stories and most important information. And actually what is happening is that currently in 24, and that's the global trend for the past 20 years, journalists are killed for very important stories that matters. Environmental crimes, human rights violation, corruption, money laundering, and so on. And so we need to know exactly the truth. And the only way to do that is to make sure we can continue their work and to dissuade the killers to kill the journalists. Forbidden Stories was the hub that released the entire Pegasus spyware story that broke the news of that, which was just absolutely a, an enormous revelation for people. I just finished the book that you co-authored called Pegasus. So congratulations on that. But I just wanted to dive into the details a little. So people have heard of Pegasus. People know that this is spyware, but this is incredibly dangerous and invasive spyware. And I'm not sure people actually fully understand the extent to which it's being used. Yeah, it's, it's true that most of the people around us are thinking that, including in my own environment, in my family, everywhere, where people think that, oh, if I have nothing to hide, I have, I have nothing to worry about. Actually, this is not truth. And this is not actually the issue. I think that the what we are facing now, we are facing um, 
uh, a global threat for democracy is because there is a, a large misuse of spyware, not only Pegasus, but all the spywares by a lot of countries surveilling people. Sometimes it's, we can talk about massive surveillance. And another time when we talk about Pegasus, it's not a massive surveillance system. It's a surgical surveillance system designed to get the precise information of a precise target at some point somewhere. And what is Pegasus? Just to make sure people get, understand what we are talking about. Pegasus is a spyware uh, sold by a company called the NSO Group that is based in Israel. And Israel is a country that is very well advanced in terms of uh, uh, industry of uh, cyber surveillance. They are really one of the best country in delivering that kind of tool. And this is a tool that is officially made and sold to many state actors to officially catch the bad guys, terrorists, pedophiles, to prevent crimes to be committed. But that's the official story. The other story, the non-official story, is that this is a spyware that is sold to many state actors like Azerbaijan, like the Saudis, like many others who have the worst reputation you can have in terms of human rights violation. And when you are selling that kind of spyware to that kind of country, you know exactly what they're going to do with that. They will terrorize the people. They will get information about their dissidents. They will try to... Um, eliminate people based on the information they can gather through their device. And the spyware itself, Pegasus, is, by the way, classified as a military weapon. NSO actually needs um, the green light for, from the Ministry of Defense of Israel to be able to export that, because that's a military weapon. So this is why, as well, it's very expensive, because it's very offensive. And it's very offensive because it can get everything you have on your device. Once you are infected, you are entirely trapped. The Pegasus spyware will take the control of your mic, will access your photos, your videos, your password inside that, is, that are stored inside your, your device. And we know everything about you, even more about you than you can know yourself about yourself. And why are they doing that? They are surveying you because at some point, one day, because you are a journalist, because you are a lawyer, because you are an entrepreneur, because you are a dissident, an opponent, they are trying to get some information to use that information against you or to, or to use that information they got from you to catch you at some point. And, and this is why it's very, uh, very concerning. In this kind of targeted malware, you have very expensive, as you mentioned, exploits that you, you can't just mass deploy to every single person in the world. And that was my in immediate response is that, okay, this is so expensive, it's only highly targeted. But what really shocked me in reading your story was how massive the deployment actually was. You had a list of at least 50,000 people who were journalists, dissidents, protesters, human rights workers, lawyers, whose phones were all being tapped. And when we're talking about tapped, as you mentioned, it's complete takeover. There's apparently a portal where you can see every app that they're currently running, what they're doing in that app. It doesn't matter if it's a secure app, if your device has been compromised, all of that is your know, game over in terms of privacy. So just talk to me about the extent of this uh, pervasive yeah. surveillance. Yeah, exactly. In, in, so in that book that we co-wrote with uh, Sandra Rigo, who is my, my co-author and was uh, coordinating the Pegasus project for Forbidden Stories, she was the editor. Where, what we did together and with all the team members of Forbidden Stories and with all the partners, because that was a collaborative effort. For one year with 80 journalists, we did work in secrecy to investigate the massive misuse of a spyware Pegasus, and to reveal how state actors were targeting thousands of people all around the world. The very starting point of that investigation was one day with another organization, Amnesty International Security Lab, we were granted access to a leak that was really new, very strange, and very exclusive as well. In that leak that both of our organization were having access to, we were able to see phone numbers, many phone numbers, not dozens, not hundreds, but dozens of thousands, 50,000 phone numbers of individuals living on the planet. And those phone numbers were the phone numbers of people who were potentially targeted by NSO. I say potentially because at that time when we received the leak, we were not having 
the forensic evidences of the actual uh, targeting. And what I think this project what bring brought to the public opinion, we were able to show the victim and the face of the victim of cyber surveillance. And not only that, we were able to prove that with many forensic analysis that we did uh, run on so many device of victims. And see, if you want, I can tell you how we did that step by step. The first thing that we did was first having access to that link, to that list of phone numbers. And the big challenge for Amnesty Security Lab and Forbidden Stories was to know to whom those phone numbers were belonging to. And the one way to do it was to check with our contact list as well. And we'd start with my contact list. And I was having some phone numbers inside and names. And for instance, I saw that some of the people around me were in that list. People close to me, friends or colleagues like Khadija Ismailova, a journalist in Azerbaijan. And her phone number was on that list. And we saw other colleagues in Mexico we used to work with. We were still, we were even at that time working with, and we were seeing them on that list. We saw as well that, uh, thanks to Amnesty International Security Lab, that the phone number of Emmanuel Macron, the head of state of France, was on that list as well. But not only him, but as well, all most of the um, government people, ministers of our country, but not only my country, but in other countries as well, and many dissidents abroad. And we find as well that the fiancé of Jamal Khashoggi was on the list as well. Mm-hmm. So it was many profiles of people. Most of them were having something in common. They were fighting for democracy because there were dissidents, there were opponents, there were lawyers, activists, journalists, or there were some of them were head of state or ministers, but there were yeah high profile people who were on that list. And the next step for us was to verify, okay, we saw that those phone numbers, we we assume and we know that those phone numbers were the phone numbers entered inside by the customers of NSO inside the interface before the attack phase. And we were willing to know if they were really, truly infected. And one way to know that was to make some tests on some devices. So we pick up some some of those phone numbers, some of those people. And this is why as well, we need a, a consortium, a large network of journalists in Mexico, in the US, in the UK, in India, to contact the victims and to say, we have reasons to believe that you have been under surveillance. Uh, will you be okay to if we take your phone for two days or three days or, or, or five minutes and we run a forensic test? And maybe we will find some evidences that you have been infected, as we used to say, in that uh, ecosystem of um, uh, cyber surveillance. And uh, and if you are infected, that's a big problem, not only for you, but for the maybe the government who is after that, and we will reveal that. So this is how we did that. It took a lot of time. And it was pretty dangerous to do that because we were basically investigating intelligence services of many countries who are known to kill journalists, who are known to jail journalists, who are known to threaten journalists, who are ready to, to do anything to, to silence some stories. And so we were that small network of journalists in the middle of the COVID crisis where it was so difficult to take a plane, so difficult to, to, to call a victim, a person that you think is surveilled, and to tell her or he on the phone that you think is surveilled. So you don't, you cannot say that. So you have to convince the person to come at some, to meet in person, which was quite challenging at the time of the COVID, because we were having something to tell the person. And then we were able to run some forensic and then we got results. And in most of the cases, we were having some confirmation that we found some traces. Amnesty International Security Lab found some traces of real infection, of um, exploit 
were in the device. And it was incredibly high, the success rate. So you guys were going through phones and you had this list, you had to verify that this was actually a list of people that were potentially targeted. And just the success rate of going through the, those numbers was astounding. So it really gave you high confidence that, yes, this is what we have. We have a list of highly targeted people who governments are trying to keep an eye on. It, it's interesting because when you zoom out and think about this and just what was interesting about the Pegasus book that you co-wrote, it's part about cyber surveillance, but it's also part just about the courageous stories of the journalists who were targeted. Yep. And what was shocking to me was, you know, when I think of targeted individuals, I think that, well, they must be leading a revolution. Like we're talking about the person who's at the forefront, but no, we're talking about someone who works for their local newspaper, who's working on a story about eminent domain and the government doesn't want it leaked and they get murdered. This happens all the time. It's people who literally just want to write stories revealing the truth. And the way that they are silenced is they're targeted with this malware, their actions and their location can then be tracked at all times and then they're very easily hunted down. Yes, absolutely. And the thing is that kind of spyware Pegasus or other ones are um, really the perfect tool for that kind of countries who don't care about human rights, who most of the time are uh, well, you have a lot of democracies using spyware. Actually, we discover as well that a lot of uh, EU state members were using uh, Pegasus as well. So the most important thing is that what you will do with that kind of service uh, intel you will collect. Will you have in your country some people to surveil the pe the ones who are surveilling the others? Who is in charge of controlling that? And what is the rules? And where I'm very concerned is that it's really the, the the wild west regarding the regulation on the on the on the Pegasus uh, and on the all the spyware. There is um, almost full impunity for the perpetrators. You are if you are targeting someone, most of the time the people, the victim, your victim, will never be aware of that. Mm -hmm. We talk about what we we call that a zero click infection. There is no need anymore to click on any link, anything to be infected. You start to sleep in the evening in your bed, you put your phone just right next to your bed. And the morning after you wake up and you don't know that, that you are already infected because there is a, and the battery is not, is not hot. Uh, there is no, uh, a strange sign that you can see now on your phone. The the industry has made a lot of progress to to make sure that you will never find any kind of traces of your of your surveillance. What was kind of scary actually that when we were the ones telling our head of state that he was on the list, we were the ones to tell people, members of the government who are supposed to use. Uh, first, not that kind of uh, device that you and I are using. They are supposed to be surrounded by intelligence community to protect them and to make sure that the, the security of our land, of our country is protected and that their, their conversation are really protected. But we were the around 80 journalists plus another organization uh, informing them that they were surveilled. They were on the list and uh, and they did not anticipate that. So it tells us about the level of uh, unpreparedness of uh, our governments about um, the Pegasus spyware. And yes, it's true as well that th this kind of spyware have been used, is used against any kind of voices who might challenge at some point the people in power in mm -hmm. some countries. And not only in some countries, but that's also a way to export the terror abroad. We have seen the Saudis or others um, targeting people in other countries as well, because there is no border for that kind of spyware. There is no border in terrorizing, in, in capturing a lot of information of someone you are tracking. And so, and there is so, back to the point of the regulation, this is where there is a lot of things to do because there is nothing to protect the citizen. First, the citizen won't be too much aware of, of that, except if you have organization like Citizen Lab, Amnesty International Security Lab looking into your device. And sometimes, unfortunately, they won't be able to find some traces. But uh, there is no regulation to pursue injustice the ones who are targeting you because most of the time they are abroad. So there is no regulation provided by the market itself, by the industry itself. So the Americans, the American authority 
took decision that was kind of impact, impactful after the publication of our project, the Pegasus project, it was to blacklist NSO and to say that there is no way uh, an American companies can make some deal with the NSO company. So they were blacklisting NSO, but uh, I think now there are, there are some discussion to make sure that NSO will be will be put out of that list as well. So there is a, a lot of lobbying as well, with um, currently done. But except that there were some inquiry committee inside the EU. Uh, it was a good work from a lot of MEPs over there and good recommendation, but actually the state themselves, they are not following their recommendation. If there is no accountability, there is no transparency at all. Uh, if you are a citizen, you should be able to know what kind of spyware is my country using? That's mm -hmm. a basic question. We should really know about that. We talk about a weapon, but the thing is, and to get as well to your point that people, I think the, the worst thing in that case, and why we don't have any kind of regulation and why our uh, elected people are not suggesting some regulation to protect mm -hmm. all of us is because maybe there is a lack of awareness of the public opinion about how much dangerous it is for all of us, mm -hmm. what we are talking about here. If we don't have journalists to inform because they are surveilled, uh, if we don't have whistleblowers or sources able to communicate with the journalists because there is a cyber surveillance everywhere. If we don't have opponents able to work to fight for democracy, really, without being surveilled and being trapped that way, there is a big risk for all of us. And and so and so most of the people think, yeah, I have nothing to hide, so that's not my problem. And I gave up with my data when I'm going to Walmart or to on or on Google. I know that they know everything around, about me already. So the fight is over. The game is over. Should I be concerned by this uh, new story about Pegasus? Yes, you should be concerned. Uh, it's not only about Walmart knowing what, your, what is your favorite color. It's, it's about a state actor who might be killing an opponent in the 10 next hours. And because of the lack of regulation, that killing might happen. So we talk about that. Yeah, that's uh, that's such a powerful point. I get those comments all the time on my channel. People just respond, privacy is dead. Why should I care about it anymore? And my response is, I mean, regimes come and go and social norms change, but your data is forever, right? And yeah. so you don't know which government is going to be in power tomorrow. So privacy is a fundamental part of a free society we need to fight to protect. We need to make sure that we always have encryption tools. We need to make sure we have private ways to communicate because you may not feel like you need it today, but you might need it tomorrow. And you don't want someone to take that option away from you by banning end-to-end -end encryption, which many governments around the world are currently trying to do, by putting back doors into everything, which is what many governments are trying to do. Like we really need to push back against this pervasive surveillance and the normalization of pervasive surveillance and remember Remember that privacy is essential if we want to maintain democracy. Yeah, absolutely. So there is always, when we were questioning go different governments on that question of privacy and privacy versus safety, this is always the way government state actors are presenting mm -hmm. the conversation. Look, you talk to me about human rights and privacy. Uh, I talk about national security of my country. And this is the way they are, the bipolar way they are presenting. And actually, it's not, I think it's not the good perspective. You can, you can think and discuss and establish rules about privacy, about having a rules that is enabling someone to control the one that is in charge of surveilling the others. And you can still catch the terrorists and the bad guys and having a, a fair policy for your citizen, at least being accountable, being transparent, at least answering that question that uh, do we use some spyware? What is the process if you if you are using a spyware against who? Is there any judge at the very beginning of uh, any kind of investigation you want to do thanks to using a spyware? So that's the basic question. It's it's possible to protect privacy citizens and to protect the national security of, of, a, of a territory that's perfectly compatible. So it's a vision they are 
most of the governments are, are offering just to simplify the debate or to make the people believe mm -hmm. that the that if you are against that kind of spyware, that will mean that you are ready to let the terrorists do terrorizing the people, and uh, which is uh, which is really yeah. A way to tell to the kids, but not to adults or to people who can vote. <laughs> right, and it's you know it's kind of like this psyop because again, I get a lot of comments from people. I'll talk about encryption tooling, and their response is, "Well, this sounds like a great tool for criminals," and they've forgotten yeah. that actually this is a great tool for free individuals in order to ensure their yeah. freedom. So it's kind of seeped into society, and I think we need to really shift culture and reclaim our understanding of why privacy is important. But it's interesting you. Mentioned NSO Group, and um, that's really the focus of this because Pegasus is a product from NSO Group. But it's important for people to understand that when governments don't have access to Pegasus, they create their own tooling. You know, Pegasus is just one example of this same spyware and these same capabilities that are used all across the world by all kinds of government. It's not like we can fix the issue by just banning one company, like, oh, we're done. Yeah. It's kind of like how yeah. they handle TikTok. You know, we're talking about mass manipulation of people and they say I know we'll ban TikTok and the problem will be solved mm -hmm. not realizing that this is endemic in all of this technology that we're currently using so what's the takeaway there because I don't want people to feel disheartened like everyone's got these tools we there's no regulation like what should we be doing in order to fight back and make sure that we're protecting ourselves I think really the first thing is to realize the the harm and the damages that this cyber surveillance and this lack of regulation is causing. When you talk to some, because I think we have to consider it's not a tool to uh, that is about collecting the data. It's a weapon. It's a military weapon used against civilians. So that means that we first have, all of us have to consider how that kind of cyber surveillance is destroying life at a human being level. If you talk to Khadija Ismailova, he will say that this is not only destroying your life, but this is victimizing, victimizing all the people around you because people around you, your lawyers, your daughter, your sister, your friends, your colleagues, your sources, that were people who were talking to you. There were people who were giving you some, sharing with you some secrets, some information. And because you were surveilled, then indirectly you put them at risk. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the most, uh, most different thing with all the traditional means of surveillance that the cyber surveillance is a kind of radioactive thing where once you are infected and then you know that all the people around you are infected then you will tell them that because of the conversation you were having with them there might be uh, they might have some issues and then nobody will talk to you anymore uh, if you are a journalist, no, you will have no more sources. If you have lawyers, you will no, have nothing, nobody to defend anymore. Uh, you will live a life of nightmare because your intimacy, your secrets, everything that you were, that your phone were knowing about you will be in the hands of between of people who at some point might use that to harm you or to harm your relatives as well. So first, I would I would suggest having more and more conversation as you we are doing today about understanding the harm that it caused at a human level. We talk about victim, a weapon, so we talk about victims, our society for our democracy, or let's say our society. It's a big issue. It's a big threat. If you don't have, as I was saying, lawyers to able to defend freely uh, opponents, uh, oppositions, a real uh, political activity that is where people can feel confident, safe, and free enough to discuss some plan to propose all another political program without fearing to be intercepted, to be captured, to be trapped. This is why it's a global threat for democracy. Let's just take the example of journalists uh, being surveilled. Many of the people we were having on the list were journalists. Why do the state actors are surveilling journalists? It's they are most of the time surveying journalists because they want to know who is talking to that journalist. They want to know who is the source. They want to silence the source. They want to blackmail the source. So if you're a journalist and you're doing a story tomorrow, I don't know, on the on a company 
like Monsanto or another company, th those kind of companies, they really want to 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 protect their reputation. So they really want to know what will be the next story. So one way to know that is to survey journalists. And uh, and once you start surveying a journalist, you will understand who is talking to that journalist. And when you get the idea of the source, you can go to the source and blackmail the source with his future, with his privacy, with the, his safety, with his life, his integrity, and many things. So, so this is why I really repeat and repeat again that uh, a cyber surveillance is needed to, of course, to protect the safety of all of us, but it needs to be regulated, and it's not actually, it's not at all. And uh, a weapon like that that is not regulated is the worst thing we can have. You are providing a weapon to people we you, you know from the very beginning that who the target will be. So, so this is, I think, where we should all think about that and convince the people we are voting for to suggest some regulation and to change the thing and to have and to have as well key players in the sectors like the companies that's interesting to see the recent move of the apple company for instance regarding uh regarding the spyware most of the time until 21 they were not really communicating too much about that they were not communicating about zero days too much they were not communicating about yeah those kind of exploits were circulating and and they were spending much more millions in communication than in safety actually as well and but in the meantime i remember the time we were publishing the pegasus project in paris and i guess it was the same in all the time the big campaign for apple was iphone is a, I, your iphone is safe everywhere we were seeing that kind of visual it's a big problem for a company like apple to communicate about safety mm -hmm. without having enough resources to prevent a spyware to infect your customers and so uh, indirectly to damage your reputation so i see I, I think that since the revelation of the pegasus project on apple at least things have changed have changed a little bit first mm -hmm. They are notifying um, now the the people, the their users, their customers, if they are suspecting some state attack committed against them. They are sending some emails. They invest and they gave some millions to I think Citizen Lab and Amnesty International Security mm -hmm. Lab to to work much more closer to the civil society uh, with those engineers who are. Excellent, and were the ones able to find the traces of NSO spyware inside any kind of device. And that's it. All the other companies, WhatsApp, Meta is pursuing the NSO group in Israel, but there is not a big chance that they win. They will be judged in Israel as well. So this is where we are. This is where we are. Yeah, it's interesting. Like the flip side of what you were saying about those individuals who are fighting power. You're saying that, well, from their perspective, they become isolated. People aren't going to want to talk to them. Their entire network is at jeopardy. But if we kind of look at the flip side of that, if we don't raise awareness about this issue, what we're doing is re we're relegating all of the people in society who are brave enough to push back, who are brave enough to speak out, who are brave enough to do research in these areas like Citizen Lab, like Amnesty, and all the people reporting on it. We're isolating all of them. And if we do that, we're not going to get the information that we need as a society to understand what's going on, to hold people accountable that we're electing into power, to have any transparency about what's happening behind the scenes. It's a terrible, terrible pattern for society to say, I don't care about privacy. It's not important for me. You know, I don't have any sources who aren't going to talk about it, talk to me. No, it's about making sure that we always have those people in society and we're protecting them if they're working for us if they're protecting us if they're yeah. holding you know it, it, speaking truth to power we need to make sure that we're mm. protecting them as a society and making sure that they're not targeted and in order to do, do that i completely agree the first step is having a conversation about this it's all happening in secret we have secret intelligence committees who are talking about things behind closed doors we have secret courts who are you know making judgments on all of this we need conversations in the open if governments work for us we need to know what they're doing Yes, absolutely. And we need, actually, it's, we, we will always have autocrats on one end and other countries who are democracies. 
So the rules would be uh, different. I think there is there is different thing here. There is uh, first of all, we were asking the French government that if they were using Pegasus. So they say no, we don't. We didn't use Pegasus because we know that by using Pegasus, it would be a way for the Israeli to know about who our, our targets are. Mm. Uh, so that uh, I think, of course, that that the same mindset in the US, in the UK, they do have spyware that they made themselves using the different organizational or department like the NSA in the in the US or, or other entities in in Europe. The key thing is that on on Pegasus, they were still trapped. Many officials were still trapped by Pegasus. Because Pegasus was so was led by the company NSO was having enough capacity, uh, financial capacity to hire a lot of people and to buy a lot of zero days. For one million, you can buy uh, vulnerability and a, a path to access that vulnerability on an iOS uh, system, for instance. And and so so there is a market, and that's. A, Something that most of the people I think don't know too much is that there is a lot of money to make if you want to become rich. You can start a church or start a spyware, and <laughs> and you will find a lot of people, a lot of photocrats ready to give you ten millions for being able to infect fifty people. That's the kind of 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 price on the market. So so there is a lot of money in that game as well. The first thing is how a private company from the private sector is able to tell something to state actors. That's something uh, as well very interesting that that's a key question that should that belong only to the national security system and or, or is it possible to have a privatization of uh, the cyber surveillance uh, industry? That second option brings the question of uh, how to regulate those exchange as well, because uh, if it's a private sector uh, selling to a state, a public actor, then how to get some accountability from which part and uh, and so on. So that's a, that's a key question. Then as well, you have what I will, what the United Nations or global coalition of countries are able to produce as a regulation to, to, to protectors. And the thing is that most of them are already using Pegasus as well. We saw that within the EU. So there were it was embarrassing for them to criticize uh, that or to speak publicly about that. Uh, I'm sure the French and were not using Pegasus, but maybe they were benefiting from intelligence collected through Pegasus by uh, some friends in other countries as well, because they were tracking a terrorist or because they were tracking another person. So th- this is why all governments, I think, whether they were in the US or in France, in Europe, in everywhere, were a little bit embarrassed because that spyware was commonly used by many state actors already. It seems that we're really looking at this from one perspective and are missing the broader picture as a society because we, like the current situation is you have all of these nation states that are kind of in this Cold War situation of escalating cyber surveillance and if they're going to use the tools, I want to use the tools too. And so we just ramped up cyber surveillance and it's pervasive and it's at a mass scale. But the result of that is that every citizen in every country now has an inability to have a private conversation. It becomes very difficult for them to stay private, to do things in private outside of the watchful eye of not just their government, but other governments. So I feel like the entire globe, the entire globe becomes less secure because they've lost their privacy and they've lost that ability to push back against governments. And I think we forget because we're just thinking about, well, that nation state's a danger and that nation state's a danger. We're just looking at that from an outside and forgetting that if we as citizens of any country lose the ability to dissent and you know communicate in private and to meet with people in private, then it's the government itself that becomes the danger to us because anyone could get into power and we have no longer retained the ability to push back against them. So this is not just about a country saying, well, we've got to protect ourselves, therefore we yeah. need surveillance capabilities, they need to you know, get into everyone's home because we're worried about country X over there. 
No, because systematizing that means that you've set up this incredibly brittle and vulnerable situation where any future autocrat that comes into power will now be able to use those tools against the people. You've basically eliminated the protections of the citizens of that country. So thinking about current threats and how you'll deal with them and using surveillance as the answer has meant that our current solution has set up this dangerous Orwellian future for every citizen in that country. And that's something people need to be aware of. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And I entirely share your your vision on, on that. In the meantime, there are still some, some hope somewhere. And I can tell you why. For instance, that project, the Pegasus project, where we were revealing the misuse, we were doing that because there were some people within Amnesty International Security Lab were under their 30s who spent years, days and nights investigating the movement of a spyware into some device. And there were at some point the two young guys were able to invent the methodology to find traces on on spyware. I think as a civil society, we have an important role. Uh, to play. On our side of Forbidden Stories, what we do is collaborative journalism. We think we're going to be stronger if we are together. We think that if someone is killed, we have to be united. We think if we do have a list of uh, people who have been surveilled, we should work together, investigate and publish that massively so people will start understanding what is at stake here. And so in many parts, from technical organizations like Citizen Lab or Amnesty Citizen Lab who are defending human rights, through technical investigation, through your role as well. That is extremely important, Naomi, to to explain uh, to people the most important things we need to know about what is at stake when we talk about privacy, surveillance, and so on. And, and, And back to your question a few minutes ago when you were talking about those different groups isolated, the journalists, dissidents, the lawyers, the one. It's true that they are isolated. The thing is that we, we, as a journalist, for instance, there is, as you know, there is a large distrust between the public opinion and journalists. Nobody in France or in the US, uh, it's not very popular to be in journal- a journalist. You are accused to be too much, too close to the uh, the people in power, or you are providing fake news to the others. And but that's the same for lawyers or for some opponents where you can have a lot of disinformation on the internet as um, that is provided as a services by private corporation to state actors to kill the reputation of some opponents using some army of trolls against one p- person in 10 seconds. And so those different actors, it's true, isolated, but we need to re-explain how those different actors need to work together. And we need Forbidden Stories is a journalist organization that we team up with Amnesty International, that is an organization in the human rights field and the technical field. And, and then we were to some hearings to talk to some MEPs to explain what we have seen as a journalist and why we think it's a big danger for democracies. And then the MEPs were suggesting some laws that nobody are implying at the end with you. But what is the most important for me is not to give up, is, is really to consider that civil society has a strong role to play if we are connected one to another one. There is a lot to do. There is no way we can we, were, we would have been able to reveal that massive misuse by with having only two journalists here working alone and trying to reveal that. You need a group of talented people, and so this is this is why there is there are still some 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 hope and and a huge need to explain to the public opinion. I think at schools as well why privacy matters, why journalism matters for the future of democracy, uh, why we need a strong and civil society. Because in front of us, we have a cyber surveillance industry that is extremely resilient. You kill one NSO today, you will have 10 NSO tomorrow. We did a large story on on the disinformation. We, um, in 2017, a journalist in, in India, Gary Lankesh, was killed as she was investigating the disinformation industry. We decided to continue our work worldwide and we discover a private company who were manipulating election and so on. And, and that was kind of new because it was at the beginning, it was only 
12 fan factory like on the Russian model in St. Petersburg. They were isolated and working only as a department for the nation. But now it's a privatization of the market. And you can see a lot of companies who are basically coming from the military intelligence and joining the PR companies and providing algorithm to provide hack and leak operation, to provide disinformation as a services to many mm-hmm. states. And so we, journalists, lawyers, opponents, we are threatened by the cyber surveillance, by the disinformation, and we need to explain to our kids that there is a, an ongoing battle that is privacy is something that we need to fight for, but we need first to understand what we mean by privacy and how much it means for our democracies. I think that it's very easy for people today to feel powerless and to feel disillusioned and to just think that the situation is hopeless. I see that around, and especially when you're dealing with something as powerful as Pegasus, people will throw their hands up in the air and say, okay, it's game over. We we have no choice yeah. because we have these tools. And especially when you look at some of the stories that you covered in Pegasus, these journalists who are just trying their best to fight back and then they just yeah. get targeted with this malware and they get killed and they get silenced. But actually I found your book to be incredibly hope-filling. Everyone should read it, first of all. It's just a wonderful piece of journalism. But what filled me with hope was knowing that organizations like Forbidden Stories exist because it's no longer the case that journalists are on their own and that dissidents are on their own and protesters are on their own and they're going to go out there, they're going to get targeted, they're going to get killed and they're going to get silenced. That isn't the the, the case. We're in a modern world where we're all, we're all digitally connected. We have amazing organizations like Forbidden Stories that will pick up the trail and will you know, continue their stories. We'll let people know what kind of corruption they were trying to unveil, what was happening, the fact that there was injustice and they were targeted. That lifting of the veil, I think, is so important as a society. And that banding together and saying, listen, we have power in numbers, we can stick together and we can all push back. And so it's no longer just these individual people fighting on their own. There are all kinds of movements now uh, with people fighting together and saying, no, this is egregious. This is hurting everyday citizens. Let's all stand together and fight back. That fills me with tremendous hope. And the fact that we're only just seeing that, because I think the digital age kind of came at us fast. We did a bunch of things that we probably shouldn't have. And we didn't really keep up with understanding the threats that this interconnectedness created. We're starting to wake up now. I'm seeing all around me people realizing that we need to make a change in how we use technology. We need to start to hold governments accountable for how they use technology, hold corporations accountable for how they use our data. And I'm seeing all kinds of cohesiveness in social movements forming around this. I'm very optimistic about the next decade because I see the power and strength that comes when communities band together. So I think that your organization is just a huge part of that. So huge thank you to everything that you do as part of Forbidden Stories. Thank you so much, Naomi. Yeah, uh, I really believe uh, regarding the journalism that collaborative journalism is the future of journalism. Uh, Yeah. The, story, the, the the crime we are talking about, whether it's cyber surveillance or environmental crimes, it's more and more global. So to, so to, to tackle that kind of global crime, we need, it takes a global network. It's not yet mainstream collaborative journalism at school, in school of journalism. It's still the lone wolf reporter model that is um, that is taught in, 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 in many schools, but we try and we do our best to change that, to change that paradigm and to to tell the young journalists that uh, that if there is a global story, they need to to work with others, and they will get more protection, more resources, more impact. So, mm-hmm. it's 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 just the perfect model to make sure we can achieve our goal and and we can play a role in in our societies. Yeah, and just to kind of explain to people the difference between that lone wolf model and yeah. uh, something like Forbidden Stories. I mean, it was apparent. I, I see a lot of cyber security stories kind of trickle in, you hear a a hint about it and then it disappears. What happened with Pegasus was there was this epic splash. Everyone around the world suddenly had it in their faces. And why is that? Because you started out with this core team of people, then you brought in this broader network of journalists, then you brought in another Breton network. Next thing you know, you have, I think it was 80 journalists all across the world from all kinds of different organizations. And you literally scheduled 
how this story was going to unfold. You were giving people all different pieces of this story. You said, listen, we can make a much bigger splash if we all work together and cover different parts of it. And the end result is that Pegasus is a household name now. Everyone knows about it. And so that's just incredible power in networking and bringing that, that cohesive movement together. It, it was really wonderful. It's the best protection to work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make sense to kill reporters if you have 79 other reporters on right. the same story. And what we do as well at Forbidden Stories is that we are offering a way for journalists who are the most at risk on the planet to um, share their ongoing investigation through what we call our Safebox Network. Uh, the Safebox Network is a place where the journalists from Mexico, from many places, from Philippines, every week or every month, sharing with us so through Secure Drop and many secure ways uh, and many secure channels, their ongoing investigation. We ask them to, so there are more than 151 journalists who are using that every week now in the world. And we talk about journalists who have been already kidnapped, who have been receiving death threats who are living in different countries. And not only they are protecting their ongoing investigation, and so in case something happens, we will continue their work, but they are making that very loud and very public. Mm. Like, I'm not anymore alone. I did share my investigation with Forbidden Stories. That is an international consortium of journalists. And if something happened to me, the story will survive and will surface everywhere. So, so you should know that I'm not anymore alone. And what is happening is that the journalists who are using the Safe Boss Network in the, in the most different, the, the most dif, the dangerous phase when you are a journalist is the what we call the request for comment phase. You did finish your investigation, you are about to publish your story, but you are knocking on the door of the people you are you were investigating for months. Um, the local deputy, this local entrepreneur that is corrupted, this governor that is corrupted, and you are as sending them some question. And so you are letting them know that you are about to reveal something that will maybe damage their reputation for, for years or for decades. So that phase that could be, we talk about a few days or one week or two weeks, is the most dangerous phase for, for many journalists. In that phase, a lot of journalists who are using the Safe Box Network are putting in their signature, signature of their email, I'm using the Safe Box Network. That story is already is having a backup somewhere. If mm. you try to silence me, that will be on the front page of many other news organizations and newspapers all around the world. So I really believe in that. We, we we started that at the very beginning of Forbidden Stories. That was one of my initial ideas when I, I created Forbidden Stories, was to not only to continue the work of others with the collaborative group, but to find a way to, 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 to protect the ongoing stories and, so, and to let the killers know that there is a backup somewhere so they shouldn't. Uh, kill the journalist. Yeah, I think that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you for everything that you've done and please Thank continue you. your work. And uh, everyone should take a look at Pegasus, the, the book, because it is just such a wonderful deep dive into how advanced these cybersecurity threats have gotten and how courageous the people are all over the world who are currently being targeted by tools like this. So go out and read it. But thank you so much, Laurent, for chatting with me. This has been great. Thank you so much, Naomi, for having me. Thank you.